Our reading uh, today is from Hebrews chapter 10. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. In the New Testament, we are in Hebrews chapter 10. This is a 2,000-year-old sermon that was preached and written down and uh, carried through the the ages uh, and then written down after Jesus' death and resurrection. And we've been working our way through Hebrews uh, and we're now up to um, this part of God's word and hearing the difference Jesus makes uh, as we look at the Hebrew passages. So Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 to 18. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered, for the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins." But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will... We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Uh, Who knows what's happening this Thursday evening? Halloween. There's an admin committee meeting as well at Alan's place. Uh, But there's Halloween. Now, here's the thing. When I grew up, Halloween was a nothing in Australia. Is this true? Um, and so it's only in the last 15 years that it was an American thing and, the, and the, we knew about the pumpkins and all that sort of stuff. But it's only in the last 15 years that it's really exploded in popularity here in Australia. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reflect on Halloween at the end of today. So I just thought I'd put it up there. I'm going to reflect on the truths and lies of Halloween. Um, But what we're doing, the main thing we're doing today is looking at Hebrews chapter 10. And so we come back to reflect, we'll reflect on the passage, what it has to say to us. We'll then come back to think about Halloween and how God's word uh, helps us think about that. Um, And I want to say two truths are going to come through from God and his word today. Two beautiful truths that I really uh, pray that God will plan on your hearts. And that is, in Jesus, there is complete cleansing of every sin. No more to pay. Just so beautiful. Uh, And I want you to know and have the assurance of that. Uh, And related to that is complete confidence uh, of approaching God. Uh, God wants you to know 
uh, that the door has been opened into his sanctuary. You can come as his child into his presence uh, through the work of Jesus, complete confidence and complete cleansing. So that's, they're the truths that we want God to put deep in our hearts, uh, and so we'll, we'll be looking at that along the way. Uh, so point number one, open your Bibles up to Hebrews 10, and we're going to consider the problem of a guilty conscience, the problem of guilt and sin. And we've heard about this a lot, but uh, the, the, the preacher, the writer of Hebrews says, the law, it's only a shadow of the good things that are coming. It's not the realities themselves, right? It's only a model or a copy. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, it can never make perfect those who draw near to worship. So the law and the sacrificial system contained in the law was incapable of making people perfect and holy and blameless before God. Now, remember, Hebrews is a sermon uh, written in the years after Jesus' uh, death and resurrection and his ascension into heaven. It's written to Jewish Christians who are considering, can't we just go back to the old way? Can't we just go back to the temple and the sacrifices and that whole system? Because following Jesus has a cost. And we just want to kind of return to old Judaism. And God says a very clear no. No, because what you have in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant, it was only a shadow. It was only a replica of the real thing that was to come and that has now come in the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to just take a moment to, to show you how the old model worked. And so I'm going to take you to the tent of meeting. And uh, So here it is. Now, this is, this is the tent of meeting as it was in the wilderness. It would be upgraded by Solomon to a temple. Uh, but this is it, the tent of meeting. And you have this outer court. So there's this kind of, uh, you know, this canopy on the outside. Uh, a member of the people of Israel... Uh, one of God's people would come with with an animal for sacrifice. Uh, and that's because they had sinned. Uh, and so what they would do is they would place their hands on the bull or whatever animal it was and then hand it off to the priest. Uh, and the priest would take it in. It would slaughter the animal, drain out its blood, uh, and then offer the animal in sacrifice on the altar. Uh, and so the people of Israel, as this was happening, they couldn't come too close to the altar, but they were allowed in that outer court while the priest did his work. The priest would take the blood and sprinkle it uh, on different bits and pieces around the place, especially around the altar. Uh, it was kind of the animal had been sacrificed in, in substitute of the Israelite person and their sin. Um, and so that was, that was a regular practice. But once a year, the whole community gathered for a ceremony called Yom Kippur, uh, which is the Day of Atonement. You'll read about this in Leviticus chapter 16. And what would happen on Leviticus chapter 16, it was kind of like a thorough cleansing of sin of the whole people of God. So on that day, the high priest would come, he'd do special preparations, he'd be wearing his special outfit, and he would offer a bull in sacrifice for his own sin. Uh, imagine that, like here is the guy who stands between you and God, and yet he needs to be cleansed of his own sin. Uh, and, and then everything basically is then sprinkled with the blood of that bull. Uh, so he takes it to the holy place, so the holy place, no one saw inside the holy place. It was covered in the hides of uh, dugongs or, you know, sea cows and, and that sort of thing, so, and fabrics and so on. Only the priests were allowed in there. And so he'd go in and he'd sprinkle the items in the holy place with blood because they had become contaminated by sin and they needed to be cleansed. So they go into the holy place and then the high priest would then go into the most holy place, the inner sanctuary, 
uh, the, the, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, but it represented the focal point of God meeting with his people. No one ever went in there except the high priest once a year, and his task to go in there was to cleanse the most holy place with the blood of the bull. Now, just imagine you are an Israelite person, and you'd be thinking, man, sin is just so pervasive. It's insidious. It just contaminates everything. Right? Even the priest has to be cleansed of sin. All the items, all the most holy items have to be cleansed. Even the most holy place needs blood to cleanse from the contaminating effects of sin. Just what hope do we have if sin is just so pervasive in the whole of life? And then, and then on that same day, they'd take two goats. One goat, the, 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 the priest would put his hands on the goat and that goat was killed on behalf of the people and their sin. And then another goat placed the hands on the goat and then that goat was expelled. It became the scapegoat sent out into the wilderness to take the sin of the people far away. And this was an annual ceremony. Uh, in fact, the people of Israel celebrated this festival just two weeks ago. Uh, so Yom Kippur continues to be celebrated. Um, and it is something of an enigma, isn't it? That this important ceremony is still celebrated, and yet there is no longer any temple there's no longer any Ark of the Covenant. There's no longer, but they still celebrate this, and yet there is no place for sins to be dealt with uh, for the modern Jewish people. It really is a, a terrible grief and a hole in their whole system of religion. Um, now, look at what Hebrews says. Those sacrifices, just show us the next quote. Those sacrifices could never make perfect those who draw near to worship. They could never make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer feel guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin. It felt like the purpose was to take away sin, but the net result was this annual reminder of just how pervasive and insidious and contaminating sin is. And then he concludes by saying, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Wow. The realisation that the whole system of sacrifices in the Old Testament is inadequate to deal with sin, such so contaminating is sin. Uh, so pervasive. And I want to say this is a problem not just in the Old Covenant. It's a problem not just for modern-day Israel, but it's a problem in any every religion on the planet. Uh, and, you know, you think about the five pillars of Islam or Danny and Sam just talking about having to offer, uh, offering a sacrifice uh, as a, you know, an act of devotion to God, the eightfold path of Buddhism. Even, even when you dig into Christianity, there are some Christian traditions that are completely rules-based and false, where we, we try to cleanse ourselves of guilt and shame, and all that it does is it leaves us feeling guilty, leaves us feeling, have I done enough? There is never assurance. I can never go home at night and feel like I am completely washed clean of every sin. And so in our society today, some people in despair or apathy, I think both play in despair and apathy, but some people abandon religion altogether in despair or apathy. And yet the problem of guilt remains. Uh, they've, they do statistics. Psychologists now look into this. Right? And they've done statistics to say that most people feel guilty at least once a day. Right? Now, do you feel guilty at least once a day? Right? The statistics are most people do, 
But the statistics for women just is so much higher for men than for men. So the statistics are 96% of women feel guilty at least once a day. Man, that is, a, that is like a heavy load, isn't it? Most days you wake up and get out of bed, you will feel guilty at least once a day. 50% of women feel guilty at least four times a day. Uh, and that doesn't say anything about the men. It just They're, they're oblivious uh, uh, and just not self-reflective. Uh, it's not that we're any better. Uh, in fact, probably a lot of women's guilt is because we don't feel guilty uh, enough. Um, but what makes us feel most guilty? There's a whole bunch of things that cause guilt, aren't there? Um, but for women especially, feelings of guilt skyrocket on becoming a mother. And they really identify that, as that, that nagging feeling that I'm not giving my kids what I ought to, what they deserve, uh, the love, support and so on. Um, it's just a massive trigger for guilt in our society. And I just want to say to my sisters out there, I, 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 I'm sorry that you live so much of your life with this heavy burden of guilt. Uh, and I want to assure you that God wants to take it away. Uh, and God wants you to trust in his promises on this. Um, but before we get to God's solution, there are non-religious ways of dealing with guilt. So I found this on Reader's Digest, uh, which I don't particularly read, but the Google's good at throwing things up. So this is Stealth Health, Reader's Digest, healthy ways to deal with guilt without having to offer a ram or a bull or a goat. Uh, commit to saying no at least once a day, no guilt allowed, right? So you've just got a rule, no guilt, once a day. Number two, recall all the healthful benefits of some of the most guilt-inducing food, right? Chocolate. You know, there's so many good health benefits. Number three, write a check to an aid agency or, you know, a missionary or something like that, and you'll feel much better about yourself. Make a sign that proclaims, I deserve this, and hang it above your desk. Just accept some selfishness. Set a no guilt allowed rule whenever you do something just for yourself. And above all else, learn to forgive yourself. So there you go. Uh, there's the kind of the modern, you know, pop psychology type of way to deal with guilt. And yet, if we're honest, the guilt remains. Uh, and, you know, we've had these self-help things for a long time, and yet still 96% of women feel guilty at least once a day, 50% four times a day. Uh, so the problem of guilt remains just as it did for Israel under the old covenant. Not even this God-given sacrificial system that they had at the tent of meeting could take away their sin. So what hope do any of us have? Well, number two, Jesus Christ is our perfect sacrifice. So this is verse 5, Hebrews 10, verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. Now, these words were originally written by King David in 1000 BC. So 500 years after the law had been given, they'd been living under the sacrificial system for 500 years. And even then, King David has this suspicion or this, this conviction that the blood of bulls and goats is not actually what's going to deal with his sin. And he, and he had an awareness that God's desire was not merely for offerings and religious ritual, but God's desire was for his people to have the law written on their hearts so that they loved him from the heart and they loved their neighbour as themselves. And ultimately, the words written by King David would find their fulfilment on the lips of Jesus a thousand years later. And so this is what the writer of Hebrews says. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. 
Then he said, here I am. I've come to do your will. He sets aside the first sin offerings, sacrifices and so on to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The whole Old Testament sacrificial system was a model or a, a replica awaiting not a, not a perfect bull or goat, but a perfect human being who actually had God's law written on his heart, unblemished, in perfect relationship with God, for that one to offer his life as a high priest, as a perfect sacrifice. That was what all the Old Testament sacrifice looked forward to, this one self-offering of the perfect man. And he cleanses us by his sacrifice once for all. He didn't enter a tent. There's no need for a tent or a temple anymore. He entered heaven itself and he opened for us the doorway to heaven that we may follow. And that brings us on to point three. That is, we are completely cleansed by Jesus. It is so good. And so listen to these three verses. I've just picked three verses uh, in this next section. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been made completely holy. Right? And it's not because we've earned it. It's because the perfect sacrifice. It's like our hands were placed on Jesus and all our sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. Verse 14, by one sacrifice, he has, been, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Um, so the law couldn't make us perfect, but Jesus' sacrifice makes us perfect as we come to him and trust in him. And verse 18, where sins have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. You don't come to church to do something that can deal with your sin. You come to Jesus for that. And Jesus has already offered the one true sacrifice. You don't need to offer a sacrifice or do anything to deal with your sin. Just trust in Jesus that he has done it on your behalf. So, Halloween. Let me, let me talk about Halloween for a moment. Halloween was part of a three-day festival in the medieval church. Uh, and so uh, the medieval church was largely the Catholic church with, with the Pope as the head and so on. On the 1st of October, you have All Hallows' Eve, which becomes Halloween. Uh, but literally in, uh, in modern English, it would be all, um, all saints evening. Right? It means the same. You know how we say, hallowed be your name. You are holy, uh, God. Right? So that's Halloween. First of November is All Hallows Day, All Saints Day. And second of November is All Souls Day. So let's start in the middle, All Hallows Day. So as I said, hallow is the old English word for holy. Uh, it was a day when you remembered the saints, the saints of the Christian era. Uh, and so, you know, the church of the day, the Catholic church, had a bunch of people they regarded as saints. Uh, so they lived such good lives that either they died and went straight to heaven or they, may, they fast track to heaven. But whatever the case, their journey to heaven was pretty quick after death. Uh, so that was the idea. Special Christians who had died and found their way to heaven. Churches were named after them. There were stacks of superstition that these saints had excess grace that they could impart to you, even though they were now dead. Uh, and so... The, Churches would collect the bones and uh, items that belonged to those saints. And, and so churches became famous because they, were, they housed 
uh, the relics of some of these saints who just had lived such extraordinary lives. Uh, and these, um, these relics had special power to ward off evil and so on. That was All Saints Day in the medieval church. All Souls Day was a day for remembering ordinary Christian people, uh, particularly ordinary family members who were Christian, who had died. When they died, they don't go straight to heaven. The belief was they went to purgatory uh, because there were a whole bunch of sins that still needed to be paid off. Maybe they were the sins they committed since their last confession or since the last time they had communion. But there was this bunch of sin that remained unforgiven. And so, um, and, and please, it's a false idea, right? But just, just hear me out. This, this, was the, this was the background. I'm going to unpack it in a moment. Uh, the, the thought was they went to a place called purgatory to pay off their sins post-death before hopefully they would make their way eventually to heaven. But if they were lucky enough, if these dead souls were lucky enough uh, and they had family and friends still alive, those family and friends could bring money to the church, especially on All Souls Day, and they could pay for the priests to pray prayers uh, and to celebrate the communion and so on, on behalf of their dead relatives to speed up their time in purgatory uh, to give them a quicker passage uh, to heaven. Uh, and these payments were called indulgences. Uh, and a lot of the architecture of the churches of the Middle Ages was funded by this sort of uh, money-making kind of schemes. Uh, that, they didn't talk about it in that way, but that's how I think about it. Um, so... Halloween, All Hallows Day, started at sundown on the day before All Hallows Day, right? Just like we say Christmas evening and Christmas Day, Christmas Day kind of starts in the evening and goes through the next day. Same with All Hallows Day. So Halloween is the first night of this three-day festival where you're remembering dead people, right? Dead saints, dead souls. And so lots of people imagined that Halloween was a night when ghosts and spirits of dead people were particularly active, Uh, especially those souls who were not yet in heaven, those souls who had been confined to purgatory, they could come back and visit uh, and perhaps even haunt uh, those who were still living. So Halloween was a night when you would say special prayers You'd go to church to have a special communion, uh, and the you, you wanted to be protected from spirits and ghosts and magical powers. Uh, it was really it was a spooky, scary night, right? and, and not a play night, but a night of genuine fear of the dead. Um, but it was scary only because they didn't understand the finished work. Of the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice once for all. They didn't understand Hebrews 10. So let me just unpack it by saying a few things. When a Christian dies, we go straight to be with God because there is no sin that needs to be paid for. Jesus' sacrifice pays for your sin once for all. So the idea of purgatory is an utterly false, unchristian concept that, w- that has been made up by confused religious people. Uh, there's, there's, not a tr- there's not a truth behind it. Um, Jesus died for sin once for all, no more to pay. A Christian dies, they go to be with God. They don't have to pay off any sins after death. Secondly, we are all hallowed. We're all hallowed. Every Christian person, whatever your past, anyone who turns to Jesus, such is the power of his sacrifice, the completeness, uh, that you receive complete cleansing. Complete. Made perfect. Let me remind you of the words of this passage. Made perfect. Made holy. Sins forgiven once for all. 
So that means there is no such thing as a second class Christian. I, I keep saying it because you need to keep hearing it because we come in feeling like I'm a second rate Christian because of my past or because of the stuff that I've done this week or whatever it is. No matter what your past, no matter the hurts others have done to you, no matter the hurts you have done to others, whatever shame you bear, whatever shame people place on you, there is no sin that Jesus, once for all sacrifice, cannot wash clean. He has paid the price, so we humbly come to him and we're forgiven everything. We are all sinners, yes, but we are all saints. So if you want to bring something good out of it, just cross off All Souls Day, right? Don't need it, right? All Saints Day is just a day of saying, hey, how good is it? And it's not just St. Peter and St. James and St. You know, Aloysius or whatever. It's, it's St. Matt and St. Rhonda and St. Noreen. And, and you just go, wow, because uh, we're all saints. Uh, that's what the day should be, uh, a celebration of, wow, Jesus has qualified ordinary people like us to have complete confidence to enter his most holy place, to come to him, to know that he's going to welcome us into heaven on death. And point number three, so we've said a Christian dies, goes straight to be with God, no purgatory. We're all hallowed. Thirdly, Christ is more powerful than any ghosts or demons or spirits or magic. He drives away all fear of the unknown. And because of him, all Satan's accusations against us are now false, invalid. And so that's not to say that we don't still feel guilty, but the remedy for guilt is not doing religious things. The remedy for guilt is hearing again the promises of Jesus, uh, that it's been dealt with, forgiven, no more to pay. And so some of our songs just bring out those truths so beautifully, and I hope they stay with you during the week. Now, finally, I want to tell you about a great Halloween moment from 507 years ago. Uh, here it is. I did, I, did, I did Luther with AI images. There you go. Uh, so if it's anything wrong with that picture, it's, um, it's Microsoft's fault, not mine. Um, but a young German man who had grown up in the medieval Catholic Church, uh, you know, the tradition with superstition, guilt... Uh, he, he had a, you know, that weekly pattern of, confess, of confessing his sin, being interrogated by the priest, religious rituals. He wanted to be right with God. He even devoted his life to God. He became a monk and eventually a priest uh, in the t- German town of Wittenberg. And yet, in spite of all this religious stuff that he did, his experience of God was dominated by fear insecurity, condemnation, and despair. Let me, um, let me read a quote. I've got it on the screen for you. He says, I was a good monk and kept my order so strictly that, if I, that I could say that if ever a monk could get to heaven through monastic discipline, I was that monk, right? A-grade monk. And yet, my conscience would not give me any certainty I always doubted and said, you didn't do that right. You weren't contrite enough. You left that out of your confession. The more I tried to remedy a weak, uncertain and troubled conscience with human traditions, I daily found it more uncertain, weaker and more troubled. How devastating. This, this man devotes himself to a life of religious observance and ritual, and yet he couldn't get any assurance. The problem of guilt remained more acute than ever. And you think, if that was what it was for him, imagine the ordinary Christian of his day and how how hopeless they would feel before God. Because if not even this A-grade monk has any confidence before God, what right do I have of even having a shred of hope that I'll be accepted. 
And Luther, what, what happened with Martin Luther, he, he started to see a big gulf between the religious Christianity he had been trained in and the teachings of the Bible. And so on Halloween 1517, he went, on to, went to the door of the church in the castle of Wittenberg and nailed 95 complaints there uh, against the Catholic church traditions of his day, which he was a priest uh, in. Uh, so complaining against the teaching, the money-making schemes of indulgences, uh, the idea of releasing souls from purgatory and so on. It's quite possible at this moment he, wasn't, he didn't get the gospel Um, He may not have understood the radical forgiveness that comes from Jesus just yet, but he was on that journey. Um, And uh, and listen to how he describes some of the experience of becoming a Christian. At last, by the mercy of God, mediating day and night, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely faith. So he'd thought of the righteousness of God as this unattainable standard that he had to live up to and he could never make it. And then he realised, yes, it is that, but it's a gift that God gives through the Lord Jesus, that he justifies us. He says, here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Right? He didn't have to earn righteousness because earning righteousness drove him to despair. But he now realised he was righteous by faith in Jesus. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. And he just took on to this confidence that he just never knew. Even though he was trained in all the religious rituals, there was this breakthrough as he read the scriptures. Now, I want to say to all of us here today, God wants you to have that confidence. You don't have to be a monk or a religious leader to have that confidence. He wants you to put your trust in Jesus and know that in Jesus... You're completely washed clean. And in Jesus, there is complete confidence. So you don't need to kind of dread the day when Jesus comes again. Because on that day, you'll be welcomed in, not because of your own righteousness, but because of what Jesus has done for you. Uh, And I want to say, if these are things that you want, but you don't have at the moment, if you don't have that confidence... Join up with the Life Series. It is a great place to just dig into it. You you can do something today. You You can just say, Dear God, sorry. Thank you for Jesus and his death for me. Please forgive me. And I'm going to pray a prayer along those lines today. But I'd love you to consider that Life Series if you want to kind of own that assurance that Martin Luther took so many decades of his life to take hold of. And I want to say to all of us who do know Jesus, I just want to remind you, you are completely cleansed. No more to pay. There is no sin Jesus' death did not pay the price for. He died for us sinners once for all so that we can have complete confidence before God. So will you pray with me? I'm going to lead us in prayer. God, our Father, we are sorry for our sin. We're sorry for turning away from you, our self-centeredness, failing to love you and to love others. We live with the guilt and shame of those things. And yet we want to thank you so much that Jesus died. Thank you that he died for me and for each one of us. Thank you that he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice once for all. No more needs to be done. Completely washing away our sin, past, present and future. We want to thank you that we have complete confidence because of him. That you will protect us from every enemy. 
confidence that at death you will welcome us into your eternal home. So, Father, please forgive us through Jesus just as you promised to do. Please teach us to trust your promises and not the lies of Satan. And just as Jesus had your law written on his heart, please write your law on our hearts so that we delight in loving you and loving one another. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.